Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. In this video, we're gonna be looking way back at the original and always classic Age of Kings scenario, Joan of Arc. As part of my campaign versus history series, I'll be diving not only into the history of Joan of Arc, but also how it connects to the events depicted in the campaign. Which parts are true, which parts are completely made up, and hopefully give you a greater appreciation for some of the details and nods to history than what you may have had in your first playthrough. Now before getting into the history of Joan, I think it's important to first lay out the setting of the story, namely the Hundred Years' War. Before the first mission and our introduction to Joan herself, France was 92 years, or roughly four generations, into what would ultimately be a 116 year long series of wars against England. There are various references to it in the campaign, from the description of years of war, the weariness of the soldiers at the onset, and another glorious loss for France to open the gameplay. It's true the war had recently not been going very well for France. England's King Henry controlled a good deal of the north and southwest France already, including Joan's hometown of Domremy, and appeared to be on the road to winning the war entirely. An important city holding back the English advance was Orléans, which the English sieged in October 1428. So that's the political context, but now let's take a look at the religious context. Both England and France at this time were Catholic and weren't just a little stitious, they were superstitious. In fact, in Joan's time, there were several well-known prophecies, one even rumored to be from Merlin himself, concerning a young maid who would save France. Religious dreams or visions of angels at the time were completely accepted, though to be treated with some healthy skepticism. Not because it was odd to be spoken to by angels, but because what appeared to be angels may also be demons in disguise. It's within that context that when Joan started to hear her voices at the age of 13, she naturally interpreted these as angels sent by God. At first, the voices just told her innocent enough things, like live a pious life, but by the age of 16, the voices told her to journey to see the French king, Charles VII, and to help him be crowned in the traditional coronation city, which at that time was held by the English. It's against this backdrop that the campaign begins. Mission 1, An Unlikely Messiah, describes Joan's journey from Vaucouleur, just outside of her hometown, to the Chateau de Chinon, where the French Dauphin, Charles VII, resided. We're introduced to Joan immediately, and she's correctly referred to here as Joan the Maid, rather than Joan of Arc. Her father's last name was de Arc, but it wasn't the local custom at the time for daughters to take their father's last name. During her later trial, she even claimed not to know what her last name was at all. She actually referred to herself as Jeanne La Pucelle, which translates to Joan the Maid. Maid here meaning virgin and not someone who cleans. That's a different kind of French maid. It's also accurate that she's presented as not being a great fighter. Though she did carry swords, one of which we'll get to a bit later, and she's sometimes portrayed as a warrior, her choice in battle was in fact to carry a banner and inspire rather than fight directly. Accompanying her in the first mission are a couple of French soldiers, Sir Bertrand and Sir de Metz, who did accompany her on the dangerous journey along with a few others that are represented by other units you pick up along the way. Sir de Metz was the leader of the small group on the way to Chinon, which might be reflected in his slightly higher attack. As well, while Joan must survive, it's actually totally okay if the others don't, and de Metz even speaks from the grave if you manage to kill him anyway. According to my research, that part is not historically accurate. The enemies in the mission are England and Burgundy. The route they take is described as being infested with marauders and highwaymen, which is probably accurate, though there are no famous stories of any run-ins with bandits or magical direwolves that can't be shot with arrows. That's some flavor just thrown in for the campaign. They did travel through both English and Burgundian controlled territory though, so there was certainly an element of danger, for Joan especially as a 17 year old girl. During the journey, she dressed as a male soldier for her own protection, a fact that would come up again later and be used against her at her trial. Upon reaching Chinon, the narrator glosses over her meeting with the Dauphin, though there's a famous story that's surprisingly not included here. According to the story, Charles wanted to test her and disguised himself among his courtiers before allowing her to enter the room. When Joan was brought in, she was introduced to someone else pretending to be the king. But despite having never seen him before, she still saw through the disguise and reportedly walked directly to Charles and addressed him as Noble Dauphin. The two had a private conversation where Charles said she was able to tell him secrets that no one else would have known, and whatever she said, at the end of it, he decided to let her go and lift the Siege of Orléans. 
At the same time, he was probably ready to try just about anything, considering how the war was going and where morale was, though there was certainly political risk if Joan failed to lift the siege. Sending a barely trained teenage girl to join the army wouldn't have been a great look if it failed. In reality, it was slightly more complicated, and before leaving there was a several week vetting process to confirm Joan was indeed pious and not a heretic, or under the influence of demons. In the end, she was declared a good Christian and that they should accept her help in order to avoid offending the Holy Spirit. To close out the first mission, the narrator tells us a certain Chamberlain is whispering lies to the Dauphin, which is based on a real person and is planting some seeds for later in the story. Moving on, mission 2 is titled The Maid of Orléans. Joan was outfitted with a horse, armor, and a banner, which is reflected through the change in her in-game unit from this point on. There's also reference to a rusted sword that she knew through a vision where defined buried behind a church. The campaign claims this was the sword of Charlemagne, and another rumor out there is that it was the sword of Charles Martel, though both claims are, let's just say, far-fetched. It reminds me a lot of a similar story behind Attila's Sword of Mars, and there's something almost Arthurian about a destined magical sword that maybe a contemporary narrator would try to throw in. It's a nod to a true story as well and is similar to something that she reported at her trial, being told by her voices where to find an old rusted sword. But the part about it belonging to Charlemagne is something she never actually claimed. The sword later broke anyway outside of Paris when she was using the flat end to hit a prostitute. There's no salacious story there, she just didn't approve of that sort of thing and ran them out of the French camps whenever she saw them. The narrator also mentions her having the fleur de lis on her battle standard. She did greatly prefer carrying a banner to a sword, so that part is accurate. But the campaign emphasizes the nationalistic symbol of the fleur de lis as being the primary thing Joan was fighting for. In reality, it was probably much more of a religious banner. It was a projection of her belief that God was with her, rather than the religiously neutral version shown in the campaign. Whatever banner she was carrying, she took it with her as she marched with soldiers sent by Charles to Orléans to relieve the siege city. The scenario suggests she was the head of France's armies, whereas in reality armies had to be commanded by noblemen. Joan may have had their ear and certainly inspired militia to join the army that would have felt great loyalty toward her, but wasn't a commander in the official capacity portrayed here. In this scenario, you're introduced to the Duc de Alençon, who is a real historical figure and one of Joan's greatest friends in the army. It's a bit odd to include him here at this point though, as I couldn't find anything outside of works of fiction to suggest that he was present at Orléans. A soldier who was present though and played a major role in the siege and has been left out was Lahir. Yo, chill dude, I said you're not in this one. The mission has you start by escorting Joan and some supplies to Blois, which is historically what happened. You then move on to Orléans, where in the scenario you take control of the garrison effort of the city and defend it while building up enough of an army to storm one of the English castles. To contrast, in reality, Joan entered the city by boat along with 400 to 500 soldiers and supplies and paraded the streets to raise morale and distribute food. There's a little nod to this in some transport ships you can find near the water. A famous one of her miracles was that as they were being picked up by the transport ships, the winds changed direction to allow them to immediately head to the city rather than remain exposed to English attack. Now, the importance of her contributions to the actual battle plans is debated, especially in the Battle of Orléans, where she is essentially excluded and ignored by the commanders. What isn't disputed though is that her presence grew the army's numbers by bringing out local militia. What also isn't disputed is that the siege had been going on for about seven months before Joan arrived, and after she arrived, it lasted nine days. It concluded with the English withdrawing from the city after a series of successful French attacks against nearby English fortifications. On the eighth day after arriving during one of the assaults, she received an arrow wound between her neck and left shoulder, something it was said that she had prophesied. English morale was boosted thinking they'd killed her, but after some quick medical attention, she returned later the same day to encourage French forces, who then rallied to take the fort. That particular victory was important as it allowed the French to freely resupply the city. It was the very next day that the English lifted their siege and withdrew. Many French commanders wanted to follow and destroy the English army there, but since it was Sunday, Joan forbade it. Overall, the map is very well done and the geography is recognizable, with Orléans situated on the Loire River, accessible through an island with twin bridges, 
Though in reality, French didn't take one, but three English fortresses. Personally, I'd prefer to see Joan's survival in this mission as optional, as in reality she received what for many appeared to be a serious wound before quickly recovering. It would also take away some of the potential frustration in having to restart the mission. It's too bad you almost have to keep her in the back in order to ensure you succeed in the mission, which Joan would not have approved of. In fact, given her history of leading the charge into battle, there is zero chance the actual Joan of Arc playing Age of Empires 2 would ever have been able to beat the campaign. At any rate, historically, her victory earned her the nickname Maid of Orléans, increasing her fame and renown in France. The next mission is titled The Cleansing of the Loire, and describes a follow-up French campaign to drive the English and Burgundians from the Loire River Valley. This happens to be nowhere near where the flag suggests, and it's probably best to actually just ignore this map. Now, of course, as the narrator points out, breaking the siege of Orléans was a great victory, but the French hadn't even begun to drive out the English. The main objective for Joan at this point was to still push on and have the French Dauphin officially coronated as the King of France. Charles was often hesitant and deliberate by nature, represented in the scenario by his advisors debating. This is contrasted with Joan's aggressive and bold attitude. Her take on everything seemed to be God's on our side, so what are we waiting for? A few weeks after the Battle of Orléans, and no doubt with a lot of pushing from Joan, they set out with an army who enjoyed a series of successful attacks against English strongholds. At this point, the English armies in France were largely composed of longbowmen that used sharpened stakes in the ground for defense. The French relied more on heavy cavalry, which was largely ineffective once the longbowmen had properly set up their defenses. A famous example of this is the English victory at the Battle of Agincourt. As the French army, including Joan, were close to the city of Pate, though, the French vanguard spotted an English army before they had prepared their defenses, and thousands of English longbowmen were charged and massacred. Though outnumbered around 3 to 1 by the English, the French cavalry ended up capturing around 20 English soldiers for every one casualty the French sustained. It was a major French victory, and if Orléans was the turning point, the Battle of Pate was the confirmation that French now had momentum in the war. In the campaign, your mission is to destroy three out of the four English castles, presumably representing the four major victories the French had along the Loire River Valley. The John Fastoff that occasionally taunts you and near the end appears with an army of cavaliers was one of the English commanders. The real story not told in the campaign though is that the decisive battle of Pate wasn't actually thanks to Joan of Arc at all. She was left behind with the bulk of the French army, while the cavalry surprise attack against the English was led by, and I'm not making this up, none other than Lahir. Uh, Lahir wishes to kill something. You know the best part about Lahir, besides his lovable catchphrases, is even if he dies, he just comes back in a later mission anyway. What a legend. Breaking up the celebration though, it's hinted again that Charles' advisors want Joan out. This is probably a reference to the Grand Chamberlain who is traditionally seen as an opponent of Joan in the court, but that view has been revised somewhat over time. Traditionally, the king was seen as a representative of God, and by questioning their decisions, you're essentially questioning God's will. Whereas if you could frame the king's advisors in a negative light, you could criticize the king's decisions in a roundabout way, as being divine but misled by evil men. To the point, it's almost become a historical trope. It simplifies the narrative, avoids undermining the work Joan did earlier to aid Charles, and also works with how a contemporary narrator would likely have framed things. So overall, I think it makes sense to present the story in this way, even if it's not completely accurate. Moving on, the fourth mission, titled The Rising, is about the French and Joan's subsequent securing of the cities around and including Reims. Yes, it's not pronounced anywhere close to what you'd expect, but I'll try the French pronunciation so I don't get reamed out in the comments. Getting back to the story, the propaganda power and symbolism of Charles VII being coronated in French tradition at Reims would add a lot to his legitimacy, but it was important to first clear the way for him to travel there safely through what was currently English-held territory. The mission is to liberate Troyes, Chalons, and Reims by destroying their town centers. In reality, Troyes was the only one that actually put up resistance and sent a friar to confirm Joan's divinity as the army approached. Despite his positive impression of her, the city still locked their gates, though they surrendered after a four-day siege without any blood being spilled. Chalons and Reims basically put up no resistance as Joan and Charles arrived. 
In the campaign, it's played up as if all three cities are taken by force, which is understandable considering a more accurate telling would have made for a pretty uneventful scenario. The day after entering the city, Charles was coronated as the King of France, with Joan kneeling and addressing him as such. Up until this point, it's reported that she only referred to him as Noble Dauphin. The narration concludes that the war is far from over. This was the pinnacle of Joan's success though. She completed the mission her voices had commanded of her, and she had done the seemingly impossible in helping Charles VII secure his coronation. In the next part, we'll look at Joan's fall. Whether from hubris, a hatred of the English, or a taste for war and glory, Joan would soon make a series of bold decisions that ultimately led to disaster. In part two, I'll cover the remainder of the campaign, Joan's trial, retrial, and the conclusion of the Hundred Years' War. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time. Okay, Lee here, play us out. Them Brits can't make a castle stronger than their ear. Do your worst, you English fop. <laughs>